Good evening. I'm Joe Nye, Dean of the Kennedy School, and it's a pleasure to welcome three distinguished guests this evening. Andy Natsos, Administrator of USAID, Peter Bell, President of CARE, and Charlie McCormick, President and CEO of Save the Children. And we're going to have a discussion of the UN Millennium Development Goals and Poverty Reduction. But before I introduce them, I'd like to uh, thank the members of the Global Equity Initiative here at the Kennedy School for putting this event together. I'd also like to say a few brief words about an outstanding public intellectual uh, whose memory uh, is being uh, dedicated to, the forum is dedicated to this memory, um, and also today's NGO leaders at the Business School have been discussing, and that's Mark Lindenberg. Um, Mark was dean of the Evans School of Public Affairs at the University of Washington and died last May at the age of 56. Uh, Mark is well remembered here at the school as a member of the faculty. Indeed, his name is memorialized on the wall as a winner of the Caballo Award for Excellence in Teaching in 1989. Um, Mark was a remarkable person who led humanitarian and emergency relief efforts in Rwanda, Bosnia, and Angola, and did relief work in Nicaragua, and was a top executive with CARE. Uh, he was truly a global citizen, and we're all happy to be able to remember him as we discuss this topic here tonight. We will miss him. It's also a great pleasure for me tonight to welcome back to the Kennedy School, Andrew Natsios. And I say back to the Kennedy School because he is a graduate of our Master of Public Administration program and uh, year 1980, I think. And he is an exact example of the type of career that we uh, admire and have hope that you students will aspire to. Um, he uh, is now, of course, the administrator of the Agency for International Development, a tremendously important position, uh, but he has also had a lifetime of dedicated public service, both as an elected and as appointed official. Uh, he'd worked before in AID uh, as director of the Office of Foreign Disaster Assistance and as Assistant Administrator for Bureau of Europe Food and Humanitarian Assistance. Before that, uh, he was chairman, and, or, or, or a, after that, rather, he was chairman of the and chief executive officer of the Massachusetts Turnpike Authority. And before that, he had served in the Massachusetts House of Representatives from 75 to 87, and was chairman of the Massachusetts Republican State Committee for seven years. So a very distinguished and diverse and versatile career uh, somebody who, indeed, we are very proud of here at the Kennedy School. Please join me in welcoming Andrew Natsios to the podium. Thank you very much, uh, Dean Nye and my good friend Peter Bell and Charlie McCormick. Um, what I'm going to talk about tonight is a subject that I have given too few speeches on and too few lectures since I took over. And I regret that, but the forums that I've spoken at were directed toward other issues that seemed more glamorous. Uh, in my view, and the view of an increasing number of people in the development community, the central reason why some countries remain poor and other countries develop, and develop in terms of rapid rates of economic growth, center around the issue of governance, of democratic governance. And the failure of democratic governance is the is a central reason why some countries are stuck uh, without growth uh, in uh, deeply mired in poverty and in chronic instability, corruption, and um, uh, mismanagement. And without dealing with this issue in some depth, it seems to me we are going to continue to fail in our effort to reduce the number of poor people in the developing world. There is a direct relationship between the number of poor people in the world and the climate you require for investment in private sector growth that leads to the creation of jobs and the reduction of poverty. There are different deb debates about what poverty is or what is not, but one thing, one sort of statistic that is used common, commonly in the discourse and the subject of what poverty is, is how many people live on less than one dollar a day. Now, it is interesting that some of those, the, the people who take the point of view or, or use that statistic take the view 
that uh, that is a statistic about social services, the inadequacy of social services in the developing world. I would argue that if you use that statistic, you are essentially taking an economic indice of what poverty is. You're, you're talking about how much income families have uh, available to them uh, to live their lives. And unless there are sustained high rates of sustained economic growth over an extended period of time, poor countries do not become prosperous. And unless the development that takes place, as with the case with the Asian giants, South Korea and Taiwan being the most sterling examples of that, that is widely distributed across the society, you do not have development that uh, enriches everyone in, this, in the country. Uh, Latin America has the worst distribution of wealth in the developing world. The best is in the giants of Asia. Uh, Taiwan has one of the best um, distributions of wealth in the world. And I would argue that the reason Taiwan does and, 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 and Korea does, uh, South Korea does, is because of the governance system that eventually developed into middle class democracies and the decisions they made about their own development. Tonight, though, I want to focus on this aspect of development that I regard of central importance. So I decided to do that tonight because we're at the Kennedy School of Government. And while you study economics here and social services and other things, it does say government in the name of the school. And governance is a central focus of what we need to be about in the field of development. Now, governance is government. That is to say, elections, political party development, and policy formulations by public officials, but is also governing which is how the principles and practices of honest, transparent, and accountable government are put in place. The definition should also include management, <clears throat> how institutions and organizations that influence public life function, businesses, schools, NGOs, foundations, clubs, societies, religious institutions, and all manner of other associations. A term, the word associations, is used by Alex de Tocqueville, a great hero of mine, whose wonderful essays on American life in the 1880, uh, 1830s, excuse me, in the book Democracy in America, actually contains some very good development theory, <clears throat> which I'm going to refer to this evening. Uh, a friend of mine who is a prime minister in an African, a Southern African country, he's a medical doctor, but he had been minister of health, and then he became the Minister of Foreign Affairs, and then he was asked to become Prime Minister. It's Dr. Mukambi is the Prime Minister of Mozambique, which is one of the countries doing the best in Africa right now in terms of governance reforms, in terms of trans improved transparency, in terms of, uh, uh, of economic reform as well, after being through a devastating civil war that killed two million people. Dr. Mukambi and I were talking one day, and he said, you know, when I became Prime Minister, I went to South Africa to a school of public administration because I really didn't know what management was. Running a foreign ministry is not the same as being Prime Minister. And being a medical doctor is not, not the same as running the government of the country. He said, that was very interesting. I didn't ask him about this. He brought that up and, and, and brought this up to me. What he said was this. He said, there are simple things, techniques that I learned in terms of setting priorities, establishing lists of actions to carry their priorities out, assigning them to people, and then checking every week to see whether they're doing what we assign them to do. He said frequently in the villages where there's a government administrator, he will assign a task and assume that it's done. And I, of course, smiled to him and said, human nature is the same everywhere in the world. We all know that making the assignment al almost assures it will not be done unless you check back repeatedly. But he went through the si a series of management lessons he learned in these courses, and he said, I was so impressed that I required all the county and provincial officials in Mozambique to go through the same course. And he said, we've noticed a dramatic improvement in management of our social service programs, our agriculture programs, our health programs, since I put people through these basic public administration courses on just basic supervision and management and planning. <clears throat> he did this on his own, by the way. There's no aid program, as I understand it, that did this for him, because I was hoping he would end by saying, AID financed this, this was AID's. It wasn't. It was his own idea. But the point is here, management is part of this as well. It has become clear to everyone in the past decade that good governance is critical to sustained development. Poor governance is one of the primary reasons that many failing states, uh, that we have so many failing states, like Afghanistan, uh, Somalia, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, and I could go through a list of other states. I wrote a book on this about five or six years ago <clears throat> on the number of complex humanitarian emergencies, which is a different way of saying failed and failing states, countries that are basically institutionally, economically, and politically collapsing, that don't function anymore, and that uh, fall into civil war. 
Good, governments, good governance depends on accountability. The corruption problem in many countries is one of the most serious challenges facing the society. We used to think it was sort of peripheral, but the World Bank has done a number of studies of countries that seem to be stuck economically and have tried to analyze the level of corruption as a portion of the uh, national income of the country, and they've discovered a massive effect, not only on uh, future investment in the private sector, but just on the proper m uh, m uh, management of public sector resources that then get diverted and, and, and abused. Um, it seems to me we need to have a more thoughtful conversation than we've had so far on why northern countries have developed governance institutions that seem to function, even though there's a wide variation in what those systems are. For the British system, of course, and the German system are different than the American system and the Japanese system. <clears throat> but it seems to me there are cer certain common characteristics to uh, the northern countries that do make our societies more accountable. And I'm not sure they're quite what we think they are. We have put too much emphasis for too long on assuming that elections, even when there are two people in the ballot for a different office, uh, is, is all you need for a democratic system of governance. You may, in fact, have a democracy, as uh, uh, Larry Diamond, a good friend of mine, who's uh, one of the two great democracy scholars in the de of developing world governments, uh, he teaches out on the West Coast, and he would argue that there are countries that have regular elections, even when there are competed elections, that are not democracies at all. There is no civil society. Uh, there, are, there, there are none of the institutions that allow for govern, democratic governance to be uh, uh, um, sustainable and transparent. Uh, there are two mechanisms that Western countries, Northern countries have developed, and I must say there are a number of Southern countries. Chile and Costa Rica have come uh, a long way. They are now middle-income countries, and institutionally, along with Botswana and Africa, they are middle-class democracies, even though they haven't quite reached the stage of per capita wealth that would make them comparable to the United States or, let's say, to Japan or, or uh, South Korea or Taiwan. But they're getting there. And they have high rates of sustained growth. And they have a system of governance that works. The first is uh, that they protect individual rights, human rights, and that there is, a, there is a control over the power of the state in terms of the autonomy of the individual. If the government fails to do its job, the press, voluntary associations, political parties hold them accountable through elections or public exposure. A free press, Jefferson once said, is more important than anything else in a democracy because it will discipline the political system. Secondly, within government, they create intricate balances of power within different levels and institutions. The branches of government were designed to check one another. Now, in the European democracies, we know that they're not the same system of divided government we have in the United States. But nevertheless, in all European democracies, there are these intricate set of balances of uh, institutions of accountability that constrain uh, corruption and uh, the misuse of authority. It's not just corruption, it's the misuse of authority. There is, I, I happen to be a, a neoconservative, and I take a more Calvinist view of human nature. Some people think that civilization is the problem that corrupts people. I do not. I believe there's an inherent flaw in human nature, regardless of where you are. There is no uh, more virtue among the American people than there is among people in the poorest country of the world. The only difference is the institutional decisions that were made around how governance took place over a very long period of time, because we had our very high levels of corruption in our own country in the urban areas in the late 19th century, as I'm sure many of you know who are students of American history. So we had our own problems, and we dealt with them over a long period of time. <clears throat> but the reality is that without institutions constraining behavior of people once they enter office, uh, development does not work very well. Trusting not to the goodness of leaders, but rather assuming their vulnerabilities, our early founders enveloped power in webs of competing institutional interests to maximize accountability. Uh, I would argue that, uh, that we need to look exactly at how those the com complex relationships exist to see why some countries in the developing world, like Chile and Costa Rica, are, are, are doing so well and other countries like Nicaragua are not. Although Nicaragua is beginning to take the steps now on their own. There's a very judge, a powerful uh, judge, and she has uh, 
basically indicted the former head of state for corruption and a number of public officials, and there is a huge convulsion, and I would say a purging going on of Nicaraguan society, and she didn't get any help from anybody else except a very strong backbone. <clears throat> Failed states, in my view, are a failure of governance more than anything else. They are a failure of the, of the society to have the kinds of institutions, informal and public sector, that mediate the tensions that exist in all societies. All societies have tensions. The question is how you deal with them. Uh, it is interesting that in the president's national security strategy, which has become, for, some, for, for reasons I don't, well, I understand why, are quite controversial, I would urge you to read it. It's actually an extraordinarily powerful document. Um, and there's a section on development. But one of the things that I liked, and I was accused of having written this, and I have to tell you, no one from aid wrote this sentence. America is now threatened less by conquering states than we are by failing ones. That is in the national security strategy of the United States government. And there is a clear perception within the uh, senior leadership and the career service that what happened in Afghanistan was not a little accident. That when you have 24 failed and failing states in the world is an invitation to all of the criminal syndicates that exist in the world. And it's not just terrorists. It's human trafficking, which goes on at a massive scale in countries that have weak national governance systems. It is. Um, the drug traffickers, it is counterfeiting rings that devalue currencies, legitimate currencies. Um, <clears throat> you can go through a whole series of uh, illegal international cartels that exist, and they tend to focus on countries with very weak national institutions. Now, what is it about countries that are either already developed or are like the ones I've mentioned earlier in the South? that are doing so well that distinguishes them from other countries. The first is education. There is a minimum level of education for job purposes that you need to have a thriving economy in, but you also need education for civil pursuits. We owe a debt to Massachusetts, and obviously I have a little bias being from Massachusetts, that uh, took a heavy early decision in the 1630s to put an emphasis for different reasons than perhaps we would today. The Puritans believed the a ignorant or an illiterate mind is the devil's workshop, or an ignorant mind is the devil's workshop, and it was dangerous to have, from a theological point of view, uneducated people. And we know that they founded Boston Latin School in 1635 and Harvard College the next year, and then in 1646, very early on in the development history of the United States, a decision was made in this state requiring every town with 50 families to open an elementary school. Now, but the other thing is I actually was uh, educated as an American, in American history, as an undergraduate at Georgetown University, and I always draw in my speeches in the developing world connections between our development and development, development of the third world. America was a weak, poor, and unstable country in 1830, 1800, excuse me, 200 years ago. We, were, we had many of the characteristics of being not a failed state, but a failing state. We had insurrections in the country. We had a massive public debt that we were not dealing with until Alexander Hamilton's reforms. You go through the list. We were a poor country. Our greatest development president, I would argue, was Abraham Lincoln, not just because of the Civil War, but because of some central things he did to create a middle class through the state college system that he created, infrastructure, creating the Continental Railroad, and the Homestead Act that distributed land in equitable fashion for a very large number of farmers. With, I think it's 100 acres. If you lived in a certain number of years, you got for free if you farmed it. But there are direct parallels between the decisions that were made in those years and the decisions being made in the developing world. Second very important uh, category of uh, institution is local government. Uh, this is, I have come from New England town government. This is what, uh, in my early career before I was in the legislature, and this is what Alexis de Tocqueville says about uh, uh, local government in democracy in America. He says, local assemblies of citizens constitute the strength of free nations. Town meetings are to liberty, but primary schools are to science. They bring it within a people's reach. They teach men how to use it and how to enjoy it. A nation may establish a free system of government, but without the spirit of municipal institutions, it cannot have a spirit of liberty. Uh, we have a heavy emphasis in aid now in our democracy and government programs on decentralization. And there is a growing awareness in the developing world that stronger local institutions with citizen, for partic citizen participation and election of local officials 
uh, may be one of the central governance reforms that will strengthen the institutions of democracy in that country. The most powerful thing the U.S. government has done in China, in fact, I would argue one of the most powerful things done in China by anybody in the last 20 years was an IRI program, an NGO of one of the national political parties, in China to train local people to village level in how to conduct competitive elections not for the national level, and for some reason the Chinese national government did not interfere with this effort. And they do have competitive elections in the rural villages. The message to the Chinese is if people do not do what they promise in their campaigns, or they abuse their office, or they're corrupt, you can remove them, which is a fairly uh, peacefully through an election. It's a fairly radical idea in China. It is not a radical idea here. And I would say it's almost revolutionary. And the notion that that value system is spreading among the Chinese peasantry is a heartwarming notion, in my view, that may actually allow a peaceful transition to a democratic system at some point in Chinese history. De Tocqueville was also impressed with a third very important institution, and that is voluntary associations. We would call them NGOs now. We call them civil society and AID. And NGOs, American NGOs like CARE and, and um, uh, save, save the children. children. I see Oxfam here. I see uh, Plan International. I see World Vision. I see International Medical Corps. I'm forgetting a lot of, I apologize for the rest that I'm forgetting here. Uh, they tend to do civil society development in the course of the provision of public service. International uh, Medical Corps works in the medical area, for example, but they also try to develop capacity, as the other NGOs do, in the villages and they tend to create local organizations that be be become self-sustaining on, uh, on their own. All of our NGOs that are really doing their job well uh, do that. And that is a central focus of developing a rich civil society that can, that can uh, help accommodate the stresses in a society. I'll just give you one example of this. And that is in um, Kenya. Kenya should have had civil conflict by now. The, Stresses in Kenyan society are overwhelming, overwhelming. And the levels of uh, abuse in the national government in terms of corruption are a serious problem. Why has there been no, there's been fighting, but no, the government has, it's not a failing state or a failed state. Why is that? There are three reasons my friend, Kenyan friends tell me. The first is the largest tribe or ethnic group of the Kikuyus, and they have a, an abhorrence of political instability and they are a, a stabilizing force in the society. The second is that the churches are extraordinarily well organized and very powerful. The political leaders are afraid of the leaders of the church, Catholic and Protestant. And the third reason is that there is a rich tradition of civil society in Kenya that has organized in a way that has actually found ways of mediating the tensions in the society and kept the country together when the government has not been able to do that. Uh, James Madison argues in the Federalist Paper Number 10 that uh, the checks and balances that we have in a stable society are central to controlling the spirit of party and faction. He says here, the regulation of these various and interfering interests forms the principal task of modern legislation and involves the spirit of party and faction and the necessary and ordinary operations of government. What he says is the, the in, in, inference to which we are brought is that the causes of faction, which I would say is human nature, cannot be removed and that relief is only to be sought in, meeting, uh, uh, in means of controlling its effect. This is a, the, the most famous of the Federalist Papers. It's a development paper. It's a paper on development. Because what, what he's arguing is that by the contending factions in society being very numerous, they will, in fact, gridlock each other enough that it will stabilize the society and allow uh, mediation between groups that will allow uh, nonviolent ways of dealing with stress. Uh, T.S. Eliot wrote a book, uh, which I've always admired, called Notes Toward the Definition of Culture, which he published in 1940. He was also an amateur, um, amateur sociologist. And he says something very interesting. He said, indeed, the more conflicts of culture, I don't mean, he doesn't mean violent conflicts, the better, so that everyone should be an ally of everyone else in some respects, and an opponent in several others, and no one conflict, en envy, or fear will dominate. The argument being, once again, that a rich group of, of what we call civil society now, in fact, has the effect of creating stability in the political and, and governance systems in the country. 
The situation in countries that uh, are governed by tyrannical and predatory governments is they first try to destroy civil society because civil society is a threat to the absolute power of the state. We see uh, that sort of thing happen in Sudan since the coup that led to uh, the NIF taking over in June of 1989. We see it in Iraq. We see it, unfortunately, increasingly in Zimbabwe, which was a functional country. It was a, it actually was developing very well. It had a 92% literacy rate, but things are deteriorating because the national government has made some terrible governance decisions. In my view, they stole the last election. I think it's not just my view, there's a wide spread view, including people in Zimbabwe, that the election was stolen. Amartya Sen has argued in his book on, his books on famine, I think uh, Jean Drews wrote one of them with him, in which they have argued that there is no known famine that has ever taken place in a democracy. First, because of free press preventing people from uh, ignoring the suffering that's going on, but two, because the democratic systems of governance force uh, legislators and public officials to be accountable to what is going on. You can see in the countries that have democracies, you don't even get close to famine conditions because the government reacts and reacts well. Um, and so, I would uh, conclude by saying, and then I will answer questions, that there are, I think, uh, several characteristics that we need to focus on other than the creation of the civil society, the creation of uh, free media, the creation of strong local governments. We also need uh, good, strong um, uh, citizen participation in um, the way in which governments uh, uh, function. Uh, the community-driven development model that is in the local empowerment and governance activity which we ran in Mozambique through our aid program is one that I understand a new book is out on now or a study by Lant Pritchett and Michael Woolcock at the Center for Global Development which has focused on the importance of bottom-up approaches to development, decentralized approaches as opposed to top-down uh, re re responses to development. Um, Finally, I want to say that, that the Millennium Challenge account, uh, which is a major initiative of the President's, the third major development initiative, I'll conclude with this remark, the, the, the President proposed in his speech before the Inter-American Bank, if you have not read it, it's on our website, I would commend it to you. We're literally using phrases within that speech to drive policy. It was carefully written over a period of five months, beginning in November of last year. Uh, and there are three characteristics that countries must have in order to qualify for assistance under this account. It's a $5 billion increase in foreign assistance, a 50% increase. We give about $10 billion in all accounts of foreign assistance. Now it will go up to $15 billion under the President's proposal, phased in over three years. Countries will first uh, be looked at in terms of their income levels, and there's some international indices we're using to make the first cut of the poorest countries. Then but we will look at these three characteristics. The first is good governance. That's why I spoke about it today in some depth. Uh, in terms of the protection of human rights, in terms of democratic elections with multiple parties, and in terms of um, accountability and transparency. The second characteristics is that our macro and microeconomic policies that encourage investment and encourage the creation of firms that in turn create jobs. And the third is, do these countries use their own resources to invest in their own people in health and education programs? For example, if a country has a 90% literacy rate among boys and a 10% literacy rate among girls, we would conclude that they are not taking seriously what we would view as equitable education levels for all children. And they would be actually seriously hurt uh, if they're directing all their resources to one uh, group instead of both. Or if 98% of their health budget is through foreign assistance and they use none of their own private tax revenues for that purpose, we would conclude that they do not have a commitment necessarily, uh, at least in some way, to public health as part of their own budget. That's the third requirement. Once those three requirements are met, the $5 billion will be allocated and uh, the country, uh, country <coughs> offices, uh, I'm sorry, the national governments of these countries will work with US government agencies on the ground to program the money and to spend the money. So uh, this is a, a s substantial change in the way we've approached development. In the past, we've used conditionality to sort of encourage countries to do what we think they should do. 
And the effect of that has been uh, that we failed. In the last 20 years, only one country has graduated from LDC status. That is Botswana. And Botswana did it with a little bit of foreign aid. They did it primarily by finding a way through governance of avoiding their diamond mine wealth being looted by government officials or elites and being carried out of the country and being used instead for, the, for, the, uh, for public services. Botswana is a well-governed society and their wealth is being well used and that's why their growth rate is high and their per capita income is high. But that's the only country that's graduated. Why is it the only country? And, and we go back once again to this question of, of reform, of governance, and of commitment without being forced to do it. We want to see the countries that have made these decisions on their own without any force from the outside. They've made the decisions to uh, make the changes necessary in their society to encourage rapid rates of economic growth. Thank you very much. introduce Peter Bell. Um, Peter is uh, an old friend. He's president of CARE USA, and it's the world's largest relief and development organization, working in more than 60 developing countries. He has a long and distinguished career, including presidency of the Edna McConnell, Edna McConnell Clark Foundation for nearly a decade. and. Uh, was also president of the Inter-American Foundation and served as deputy undersecretary for U.S. Department of Health, Education, and Welfare in the Carter administration. Peter. Thank you very much. I'm uh, very pleased to be here, and um, particularly on this occasion, which is uh, celebrating the life and contributions of uh, Mark Lindenberg, who was for uh, 20 years a close friend and, and colleague. Uh, and we got into a lot of trouble together over the years. The, uh, and I also <coughs> want to say at the outset uh, how fortunate I believe we are to have Andrew Nacios as the administrator of the Agency for International Development. And I mean it as a compliment to say, too, that I think there's been actually a great deal of continuity between Brian Atwood on the one hand and uh, his successor, Andrew, as well. And it's, and that is meant as a compliment to both of them. The uh, Indonatio started off with a statement uh, that I think is vulnerable at the outset, in which, in which he said, the central reason why countries remain poor is governance. And certainly, I think yeah. governance is important. And uh, all of us, I suspect, would argue uh, that we can engage much more productively in supporting developmental processes in countries that have good governance and that are more open and more democratic in their governance. But I think we're, we're in trouble. And of course, this is a, a statement, too, that is subject to empirical verification. And you perhaps have already read books that uh, uh, substantiate uh, Andrew's argument. But I'd be wary of any single uh, panacea uh, for, for development or for overcoming poverty. Uh, there are, of course, uh, questions about exactly, and Indonesia has, has enumerated some of the elements of uh, democracy or of good governance. Um, but I have some concern, too, about whether the United States should on its own attempt to apply a kind of litmus test as to what constitutes a democracy. Um, we have a history in this country of having seen, for example, grow up in the context of Central America, so-called facade democracies that had the appearance of democracy in large part for, the, for U.S. consumption. One hopes that we've learned a fair amount in the, uh, inter uh, in, in the intervening years uh, not to succumb to imposing sort of other criteria, like those of the Cold War or the war on terrorism, 
on definitions of uh, good governance or democracy. I also think that it's, uh, there are other sort of underlying causes of poverty. Uh, one, for example, very often is conflict, particularly internal conflict, which keeps con has kept countries like Angola and Sudan uh, poor, together with other factors. Yet another is discrimination, and uh, whether it's uh, racial or ethnic or gender, uh, it's also a very Im important underlying cause of poverty. Uh, and of course, there's the issue uh, as well in countries where, you know, it could be argued in South Korea that democracy, that democratization has been very supportive of the development of the country. Could equally be argued that uh, increased, uh, the, the, the growth and quality and commitment to education, uh, starting with basic education on up, has been highly correlated uh, with uh, development in South Korea, as in a number of other countries. And even, I think, not perhaps quite so strong an argument, but a similar sort of argument could be made with regard to access to safe water. It takes a number of different factors uh, coming together uh, to produce development and to overcome poverty. And finally, I, I would mention one other uh, factor as well, and that is that I believe that as we, uh, within the United States, think about good governance and think about democracy, we tend to think about our own government within the United States. But I think it's also important for us to think about the United States as the world's only superpower and the United States in the world. And the importance of the United States modeling democratic governance as we play our role in the world and interact with other nations that share this world. Thank you, Peter. Uh, next, we'll hear from Charles McCormick, who's president and CEO of Save the Children Federation, a private organization with programs in 18 states in the United States and in 40 countries overseas that implements programs the focus on primary health care, microenterprise, and basic education for disadvantaged children. Prior to his current position, he was president of World Learning, a Vermont-based NGO, and has been a member of the U.S. delegation to the World Food Summit and the 2002 General Assembly Special Session on Children. <clears throat> Let me also begin by saying what an honor it is to uh, be here at a session uh, remembering Mark Lindenberg, who whose spirit, uh, I think, would, would permeate the, the subjects that we are discussing. Uh, let me also uh, applaud the, uh, the recognition that uh, democratic uh, uh, cultures and forms are, are crucial to development. Uh, I think for too long, uh, it has been underemphasized, so, uh, so I think it is important that it takes, uh, takes a uh, a principal place uh, while uh, recognizing Peter's point that uh, uh, there are several other key factors, trade and human resource development and so on. Uh, I would just uh, raise uh, uh, two or three additional thoughts and points about uh, uh, building democratic cultures and structures and systems <coughs> uh, that are all well known, but one is uh, uh, that those terms uh, uh, have different meaning and different consequences in different cultures. Uh, and as we all know, the Prime Minister of uh, Malaysia, for example, is, uh, has been very uh, direct in, in regard to making the point that there's, there's more than one uh, type of democratic culture. Uh, secondly, very often uh, uh, a, a particular country uh, Democracy um, has, has many uh, variables. Many countries have, are democratic in some and not democratic in others. So managing the, the, the process of, uh, uh, of furthering democracy um, is one where the devil is in the details. Uh, third, uh, 
there are clearly uh, tensions and contradictions uh, in many cases between our, our foreign policy goals and, and our development goals. Uh, we could take the countries of Central Asia as an example, uh, Tajikistan and Kazakhstan and uh, Azerbaijan and so on, where uh, the, the leadership uh, could hardly be less democratic, uh, and yet uh, we are more and more supportive um, of those governments. Uh, for foreign policy reasons. Uh, in much of the Middle East and the Arab world, uh, uh, the, same, the same would be the case. Uh, it was noted after the, uh, the Arab summit this past year, when they did the post-summit photo op, <clears throat> that there was not one elected uh, person um, as the, the, the prime minister, president, or leader um, of any of those countries. Uh, and yet many of them are our key foreign policy uh, allies. Uh, so, uh, so we send mixed messages, it seems to me, um, uh, uh, very often. And it, it would seem to me important to find, find a balance um, between our, uh, our national security foreign policy commitments and our development knowledge um, that uh, the democratic systems are our very important uh, uh, to development. Uh, finally, uh, uh, the, the practical question very often is uh, what to do until democracy um, can be real. <clears throat> uh, because as Peter Bell suggested, when, uh, when you have illiteracy, poverty, oppression, gender uh, oppression, it is very difficult to have sustained uh, democratic governments, and what are the best ways to allocate scarce uh, development resources in those kinds of circumstances? And here I would uh, I would make a real pitch in these kinds of systems for building the culture and behavior and uh, uh, practices of uh, democratic values and democratic interaction. Uh, and I do believe that non-governmental organizations like uh, uh, Save the Children and Care and Oxfam and International Medical Corps and World Vision and many others, in some ways, <clears throat> looking back over the, the generation or so, the 25 to 50 years that we have been so active, the case might be made that our greatest contribution has not been in the technical assistance or the economic transfers, but the modeling of ways of acting. Uh, and that egalitarianism and participation and talking back and, uh, and promoting women um, have been front and center in the work of non-governmental organizations. And in many societies, those were all quite revolutionary behaviors to, to, to model. <clears throat> and uh, over the past 25 or 30 years, there, as everyone is aware, has been an explosion of national non-governmental organizations, where in, in countries like Bangladesh, two or three of the largest, most important institutions in that country are non-governmental organizations, whereas they hardly existed 25 years ago. So while, uh, while in, in failed states and elsewhere, we, uh, we await the uh, the outcomes of democratic practices, uh, it, it does seem to me that in investing in institutions that are, are modeling gender equity, that are modeling participation, that are modeling empowerment, um, is, a, is a very key set of investments. Thank you, Charlie. Uh, we now have time for questions uh, from the audience. There are two mics on the floor, two in the balconies. Uh, we'll go around them by rotation. Uh, I'd like you, as you ask a question, to identify yourself and your relation to the university, uh, to keep your question brief, and to address it to a particular member of the panel. Uh, let me start here. Hello, my name is Tiffany Agano. I'm a sophomore at the college, and on behalf of the International Relations Council at the Harvard College, I'd like to thank you all for coming. Um, the program title, uh, I believe, is Reducing Poverty, Are the Millennium Goals uh, the Way Forward? 
Um, and I believe it refers to the Millennium Development Goals set forth in the Millennium Declaration by the UN and the UNDP. Uh, perhaps you could actually address uh, the, the title question of the discussion. <laughs> and with regard to um, Millennium Development Goals, specifically the first MDG, which is the having of poverty by 2015. And if you could do so, perhaps specifically with regard to the dozen plus uh, Millennium Development Goal reports by individual countries, the feasibility, are MDGs feasible in the financing goals report? Okay. Thank well, you. I, I would first say that I guess I haven't made my argument clear enough. I am suggesting that the Millennium Challenge Goals are not achievable unless we have a platform of, of, of um, improvements in governance. Now, there are, there are no perfectly governed societies on Earth, I mean, including the United States. I always find it a little disturbing that we lecture the rest of the world in governance when we have our own problems. The Europeans do the same thing that we do. We lecture other countries. Uh, but the fact is that the argument I was making is that you have to have a platform of some minimal requirements. One of them deals with accountability. The reason democratic governments governance improves the chances for a country to reach the Millennium Challenge goals is because it allows the people to put pressure on their leaders to have the right policies that encourage those goals, that encourage also the micro and macro economic reforms necessary for rapid rates of economic growth. How do you reduce the level of poverty? By growth. That's how you do it. I have not heard anybody make a serious argument. I, I shouldn't say that. There are people in some of the European democracy, particularly the Nordic countries, that believe in the transfer of the welfare state model in the Nordic states, and many of these ministers are good friends of mine, including Hilda Johnson, the minister in, uh, in Norway, and they do believe that transferring the notion of transfer payments in the sort of a la the northern uh, European countries uh, is the way to eliminate poverty. Of course, the question is where the wealth comes from to transfer. If a country's, everybody's poor in a country, where, other than in foreign assistance, and you can't permanently produce foreign assistance as a source of revenue to support a welfare system. There has to be some growth in the economy to produce tax revenues to allow you to have public services. And so the argument I was making is uh, you don't have to achieve a high level of democratic governance, but you have to begin to make the reforms. Mozambique still has some serious governance problems. They have problems with accountability in the government. But they are sweeping through their legal system and making changes to make their system more accountable. Mali has done the same thing. So has Ghana. So has Senegal. Why are those four countries doing better than the Zimbabwe's of the world? I would argue it's because of changes in governance, in improvement in democratic governance, broadly defined. I, I, I actually prefer, I suppose I'm going to get into trouble with the media here, but I prefer a parliamentary system of government. I think the British system has something to speak for it. I'm not suggesting we transfer our divided government system to every country in the world. That's their decision to make, not our decision. I'm simply saying there's some minimum requirements that, re that if they're focused on by a country in their changes of governance, both the way in which they elect their leaders and they remove their leaders, but also this rich tapestry that I was mentioning earlier of civil society, of religious institutions, of local NGOs, of international NGOs, of business associations, that sort of create a network that allow mediation of conflict in the society so they don't become violent. There is a direct connection between the failure of governance and failed states and violence and civil war. Uh, we did a study in AID before I took over because I'm really focused on the issue of conflict. We've added it into the central focus of AID's work is conflict, how to deal with it. And we did a study and I asked the mission directors in 79 countries we have missions. How many of your countries have had either a civil war in the last five years or widespread sustained violence? Two thirds of the countries that had been in that situation, two thirds. Not all failing states, but I mean, that level of violence over that period of time can destabilize any progress made on the development side, in social services or in terms of economic reform. But at the, at the heart of failed states are a failure of governance. Thank you. Let me turn to the right uh, uh, side. Uh, Mr. Natsios, I'm Amir Atarin, a research fellow here at the Kennedy School. You've talked eloquently about what developing countries need to do in governance and a growth-based model, but what about governance in the U.S.? Your administration, uh, the Bush administration, has joined several other administrations for the last 30 years in promising that the U.S. would give 0.7% of its GNP for foreign assistance. 
23 countries in the world have made the promise. Guess where we are today? The U.S. is in 23rd place. We're the least generous country as a percentage of our wealth. That economic powerhouse on the Aegean known as Greece outspends us on a percentage basis. And very contemporary for you, uh, just last month, rather two months ago, the president uh, refused to spend $200 million that had been voted and appropriated by Congress for AIDS. We're not making forward progress on this. We're in 23rd place. We're the least generous country of them all. And we're taking steps that would push us back even further. If we happen to take your policy Are you familiar with the Millennium guide, Challenge account speech and the commitment and the... And the, that, that challenge account would raise our percentage somewhat. We'll no longer be in 23rd place. We'll be in 22nd. We'll pass up Greece. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Is this a serious effort? Uh, and do you think that as far as benchmarking governance sure. goes, that this indicates any sort of governance at all within your institution and the Bush administration? I think, I think one of the problems in the debate over foreign assistance, and Peter and, and Charlie may very much disagree with me on this, I've been doing this work for 13 years. I think it is an intellectual, being intellectually dishonest to suggest that the major problem facing the third world is how much foreign aid they get. That is not the reason, that is not the reason anybody studying this really believes that, fail, that the development is failing. We have been, we've spent a trillion dollars in foreign assistance in the last 40 years. We are not succeeding in this work. In the last 20 years, only one poor country has succeeded in moving up, and they didn't do it primarily from foreign assistance. That's Botswana that I mentioned earlier. The 48 poorest countries are still stuck, and they get large amounts of foreign aid now. If the United States spent the amount of money that you suggest, the seven, by the way, President Bush never agreed, nor did any other administration say they would support 7% of the gross national product. If we, well, I, know what, I know what the percentage is. We have many debates about it. That is not a serious debate. There would be no support in Congress, I might tell you, in either party, substantial support for doing that. There never has been. We have never used that as an indice of the size of a program. We now have the second largest foreign aid program in terms of actual numbers in the world. The Japanese have the largest. They're about to cut theirs 10%. We're increasing ours by 50%. One of the problems we face in many of these countries, a serious problem, is absorptive capacity. We are very concerned now that the huge amount, which is the largest foreign aid increase, by the way, in 40 years of American foreign aid history, no president has proposed anything even close to this. And we look carefully back over all the records going back to Jack Kennedy. This is by far the largest increase. So you can be critical, but in the historical context of the United States, it's a massive increase for us, and it is a commitment we intend to carry out. If, I do not believe that the principal problem is a transfer of wealth from the North to the Some people believe that. I do not. I think it's nonsense. Do we need more foreign assistance, however, to stimulate the kind of activities that will <coughs> stimulate economic growth, improve social services, and help with governance reform? Yes, we do need more money, and that's why the president proposed it. But the, the, the World Bank has done some very interesting work on this, and a lot of development uh, professionals like Larry Diamond, who's not a member of the U.S. government, and I, I like Larry, and Tom Carruthers, they're critics of us sometimes. But they, they focus in the governance area. Uh, Michael Porter at the Harvard Business School would argue that our principal failure has been uh, in the microeconomic area of the development of firms that produce jobs that expand the economy. Charlie, you and Peter wanted to come in on this. I just wanted to raise the, the, uh, the perspective of, of who, whose problem is it. Uh, that it, does, it seems to me it's not fundamentally a, 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 a problem of, of, of our government. Uh, it is, it is, a, it is a, 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 a citizen problem. It's a problem of, of organizations like CARE and Save the Children and others not, not having found a way to successfully mobilize political support. Um, and that's, in fact, we're here, nine of the major organizations, to see if we can uh, develop a, a uh, long-term, uh, serious campaign uh, to build political support for uh, more humanitarian assistance, development assistance. But the fact is that today it's not there. Um, uh, human development assistance of citizen priorities ranks number 31. Uh, people like it, but by the time they get there, uh, the well is dry. 
so it's our collective problem, it seems to me, and it's a very, very tough problem. Uh, the U.S. public has lots of misperceptions about how much of their, their money goes to development assistance. Uh, they have a lift yourself up by your bootstraps paradigm about uh, economic change. So, uh, so they say, uh, why don't people take, take care of these things themselves? Uh, and uh, they believe it's been wasted. So, uh, so one has to overcome all those misperceptions about, uh, about uh, the U.S. investments in these, these things. And let me tell you, it is a very, very tough job. But the government isn't going to do anything different until they hear more uh, from their constituents. Peter? I don't, I, I don't think you could make the argument that uh, we are fully using the absorptive capacity for productive development in, in the poorer parts of the world. Uh, nor do I think that it's a uh, correct argument to say, look at the last 40 years and look at uh, what development assistance has brought, particularly during the Cold War period when so much of that money was used for political purposes and very often uh, to support anti-communist anti uh, dictatorships. Uh, I think we've learned a tremendous amount over the, oh, over the years about what is effective a development assistance. And now, it, as uh, Charlie was suggesting, it's really incumbent upon us who are engaged upon it to make, uh, in, engage in it to make the case uh, uh, that development assistance can be effective and how it can be effective and to mobilize support behind it. I'd just like to take one minute too to, to uh, on the Millennium Challenge question since it was our announced top topic this evening. And simply to say that uh, I, I but within care, uh, we take uh, the, the development uh, challenge uh, goals very uh, seriously. And in fact, our overarching goal within our strategic plan is to contribute toward cutting extreme poverty in half uh, by the year 2015. And we have, have worked hard to develop sort of measurable uh, indicators of uh, the contribution that uh, we are making toward that goal. And even with the, the challenge account that uh, Andrew Natsios has talked about, I would, I would really like to see the United States get behind the, the goals that have been set up by the international community well, well, and make explicit its contribution to advancing those goals. That we did. Read the president's speech. But the then you, five billion dollars, Peter, is toward the Millennium Challenge. But he then explicitly, when you, he explicitly endorsed them and said the five billion dollars will go to achieve those objectives. But then when we you were talking about it, you would talk about the, ch the challenge account as though it were sort of something on the side and something that needs to be done before we can advance those other goals. No, no. it is, they're intricately related. What the president said is we endorse the goals, and the question is how to get to them. How do you cut poverty in half in, what is it, 20 years, whatever the commitment is that's in the objectives? You do it by sustained rates of economic growth. How do you get to that? You do it through governance reforms, good governance, good management, and protection of human rights in the context of the culture and micro and macroeconomic reform and the social services. It explicitly says it in the speech. We endorse the goals, the money will be spent to achieve them, but there is no way to sustain uh, social services without tax revenue over the long term in poor countries. And how do you do that? You have to grow the economies. And there's no other way, I've never heard anybody seriously argue there's any other way to reduce poverty than having the economies grow, Peter. And what we need to do in aid is refocus better our, our, our work to see the different stages you need to do uh, need to accomplish, whether it be infrastructure, which we got out of because people don't like to do it, the banks got out of it, almost all the donors got out of it. I think it was a mistake to do that. If farmers can't move their surplus, and 70% of the poor people in Africa live in farms and rural areas, I'm a, you know this already, but, uh, but if you don't have roads to move the surplus from the rural areas to the urban areas, they're not going to grow any extra food. They'll just rot. So you have to have infrastructure, you have to have port facilities if you're going to export stuff. We, we have to go through those conditions necessary to sustain that growth. And one of the suggestions I'm, 
I, I'm making here is that you have to have a foundation of some good governance. I'm not suggesting, uh, I'm not under any illusions that country's going to achieve it. We didn't achieve it quickly. I mean, we achieved it over a, a century. We're putting pressure on countries to achieve it much more rapidly than that. Let's turn to the balcony on the right. Uh, hi, my name is Bob Elliott. I'm a junior at the college and one of the founding members of the Student Global AIDS Campaign. Uh, Mr. Nasios, I'd like to thank you for coming out tonight. Uh, earlier you held up the example of Botswana as one of the great successes in Africa where democracy has created great economic growth and success for the entire country. But what you neglected to mention was anything about HIV and AIDS and its influence in any sort of developing countries. And that surprised me. In fact, 85% of 15-year-olds in Botswana today will likely die from HIV and AIDS in the course of their lifetime. How is a country like Botswana or other similar African democracies to maintain its democracy when those who will grow to lead the country will likely die of HIV and AIDS? And more importantly, couldn't this crisis be at least somewhat averted if officials from developed countries like yourself begin to support access to treatment and fully fund their portion of the global fund to fight AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria? Thanks. First, by far the most generous donor to the International Fund is the United States. 50% of the funding for the fund comes from the United States, from, in fact, from my account. I, we, we transfer the money from AID. So 50% of the money in that account comes from the United States. Two, the staff in the original fund were primarily aid staff. Why We transferred them, we seconded them there because there was no staff at the beginning and they began to work to set up the systems if you look carefully in the countries that have submitted grant proposals to get money out of the fund, the first round is now uh, in process, go to the countries that got the grants and ask them who helped them write the grant documents. It was the USAID missions in the field. So we've supported it with staff, we've sort of supported it with $500 million in initial phase, and if it succeeds, the president says, we will put more in. We have, however, a very large bilateral AID AIDS program which goes directly to the ministries of health and the NGO community, Care and Save the Children, are working in this. In fact, all the NGOs here that get government funding are likely working in this in some area or other because it's not just, an, the AIDS crisis is not just a health crisis. Uh, we're losing more teachers in Zambia than they're producing the teachers' colleges. It is an education crisis. We're losing accountants in the banks at a much more rapid rate than the business schools are producing them. We have food insecurity in countries and high rates of acute malnutrition in countries where there is no conflict, there's been no drought, there's been no crop failure because the crops aren't being planted, there's no one alive left in the countries in the village. I've gone to the villages, there's no plants, there's no crops being planted. Uh, AID, 60% of our budget is, of our development budget is for public health, public health. And there's been 25% increases through both the Clinton administration and the Bush administration. And since we've been in, we've proposed increases. It's not just Congress approving it. They have approved it. But we proposed it, and President Clinton's administration did it. That is something we all agree on. But, but one, sir, one, no, not, sorry, there's one question per customer. We have another question Not a penny for treatment, me. sir. What? Not one penny for treatment. Oh, that's not true, sir. For any person. Up, we are setting up anti reprovival uh, pilot programs in Kenya and in, this is AID now, in uh, Ghana and in Zambia. Through pressure, I mean, I have to tell you, the best, the best intervention in, in most of these countries is what any school of public health, including the Harvard School of Public Health, will tell you. It is prevention, because there is no cure for AIDS. Antiretrovirals does not cure AIDS. It simply maintains it, and it's a, it's a difficult thing in countries that do not have good health care systems. We are, however, trying it in three countries that do have healthcare systems of some rudimentary capacity. Botswana, by the way, CDC, outside of aid, we work with CDC in the field, but they have their own extensive program. And the Gates Foundation has put a lot of money in. They've been working on it for a year and a half now. And the Gates Foundation, if you talk to them privately, by the way, their health budget at the Gates Foundation is 650 million bucks a year. We work with them very intimately around the world. If you ask Gates Foundation who their best partner is, they'll probably say H uh, USAID. We're, we're, they are working with CDC in Botswana. Botswana has one of the best health care systems in Southern Africa. They're still having serious problems. So it is a scourge of Africa. It's a scourge. Uh, the, the highest rates of growth are not in Africa, however. They are in India and the so uh, former Soviet Union, Russia. 
We're very worried that the epidemic is beginning to get out of hand in the, the urban areas of India and among drug users in Central Asia and in Russia. We were very concerned about that. And AID just did a survey in, in Burma, which is a very controversial subject as to whether we should be there. I insist we be there. Congress has agreed to it now because we think the rates of HIV AIDS in that isolated country with a repressive government are extraordinarily high and we're beginning to in, uh, begin interventions there now. So we have the appropriation level for this year will be 500 and 575 million just for our bilateral program from AI, AID. And you ask people in the developing world, in the ministries of health, which are, wh who was out in front first in this? The United States through four administrations. It's not a partisan issue. We started this in 1986. The successes that have we had in Uganda, which are the most successful in dropping the infection rate from 23% down to 7%, are through very, very powerful national leadership by President Museveni and a series of about 10 interventions we've experimented with, we've proven they work, and now we're moving up to scale in, in Uganda. And Museveni will say that's not the chief problem facing his country now, because they've got it under control. We're trying to transfer the Uganda model that was so successful to other countries that are willing to help. But without national leadership, I've got to tell you, this doesn't work. If the head of state and the ministries resist, we can't change that. We can only help when there's local support. The left balcony. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Khaled Imara. I'm from the Center for International Affairs at Harvard. Uh, I'm a fellow. Uh, my question actually is about a, a, a theme that was very shyly mentioned in, in the three presentations, which is the uh, gender issue, the women, empowering women. I think we cannot talk about poverty reduction in a, a big parts of, of, of uh, where poverty is, which is Africa without talking about the issue of uh, uh, women and, and uh, their participation in society. Uh, it is, in my mind, a, a, a historical uh, a mistake, maybe, uh, that uh, uh, unfortunate for, for the African continent, that uh, uh, actually uh, women were deprived from their economic role uh, and, uh, uh, let's say, uh, uh, their uh, uh, control of trade and agriculture historically in this continent and uh, has been replaced by uh, uh, males that were much easier to deal with in, in, in colonial, uh, let's say, context uh, uh, in, in, this, in this continent. Uh, it is beyond... Uh, we need the question because we are nearing the end of our time. Yeah, I'm sorry. Question, please. The, the question is, I don't see, you know, in, in, in the, the approach that you have uh, uh, suggested, uh, very little that's been said about uh, women and what is uh, uh, the United States uh, doing in that respect. Uh, let me uh, we'll go back to the Millennium Challenge Goal speech the President gave. Governance, economic growth, and two social services, which we believe are of central importance. One is health, and the second is education. The President's first instruction to me before I could even make any decisions was there's going to be a 25% budget increase in your primary education account and find the money and we proposed it. We got it through Congress. Congress was very generous. Uh, and we've got another 25% going through uh, when this budget goes through for 03. But let me go back to the question of education. Uh, there's a lot of research that's been done on the effect of, of primary education on a wide variety of things. We know in many, but not all, African countries, the primary um, driver of agricultural development are women. They do the plant, they do, the, the men frequently go to the cities for work or they'll herd their animals, but the sedentary agriculture is done by the women. And a study, studies have been done in a number of countries that show without any input increase, without any input and no training, if you increase a woman's education to sixth grade level, there's a dramatic increase in food production. It, and Zick, Richard Zeckhauser, who teaches here, is a friend of mine, actually did a study in uh, Bangladesh. I don't know if Richard's here. He's right me. here. Where are you? We did test it, Richard. You're, you're right. Uh, the, there are certain calculations that if farmers, men or women, know uh, in the villages to calculate which inputs at what cost would render the greatest profits, which, where, the great, where this is the greatest demand for different kinds of uh, food production, that it will increase production and increase family wealth. The way you do that is to increase women's education so it's equal. And one of the standards we're looking at, which we haven't announced yet, I'm getting, I'm getting into more trouble here by announcing things before they've been formally decided, but there's widespread agreement among the interagency process that one of the public education um, 
indices we're going to use to determine eligibility as countries that have an equal level of literacy among girl children and boy children. If a very high percentage of the girls are illiterate and a high percentage of the boys are illiterate, we are concluding there is discrimination in the system and that the country is making a serious mistake. And the best way to make the statement is not speeches and policy statements, is money. You want the money, you're going to have to show, if you want it from us, you can get it from anywhere else and do anything you want to, but we are not going to contribute to a system that discriminates between boys and girls in, in school. And I think that is the primary way in which to advance the role of women and the, import, the, 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 um, and the income and livelihoods of women. Child mortality rates go down. Everything else being equal, if you just increase the education levels, primary education levels of, of mothers. I mean, there's a whole variety of good side effects to high education levels. And, and if you look at the countries that high have high literacy rates for women, you see the country and the women, women's role in society profoundly change. They won't take the treatment that they have in other societies uh, because of their education. We've run, run out of time. Uh, we're past our closing time. But let me ask uh, Charlie or Peter if they want a quick final word. Just, uh uh, on, on the Millennium uh, Development Goals, it, it, it seems to me, as we have implied throughout this discussion, the, the, the great debates and issues and decisions are not about the goals. They are uh, the methodologies and priorities and approaches in achieving them. Um, and I encourage everyone to be, to be involved in these debates. Uh, how, much, how much is it trade? How much is it transfers? Um, and, and very significantly, um, what kind of investments have to be made in gender equity. We're all aware that 70% of the poor are girls and women. So the goal of cutting uh, poverty in half by 2015 can't be touched uh, without, without seriously addressing this issue. So uh, those are where the fights and the important decisions are going to come. Peter? The special role of NGOs is to, to continue working through thick and thin whether the, the governance is good or the governance is bad. Uh, take uh, Afghanistan, for example. CARE has been working there for some 30, 30 years, uh, with the ex uh, going back to 1960, with the exception of the Soviet period. And uh, during the Taliban period, we worked with more than 250 uh, community schools. 43% of the students in those schools were girls. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I received an email from uh, Sally Austin, our assistant country director in Afghanistan, saying that she had visited uh, Ghazni town in a secondary school there that contained 3,000 girls. I had visited Ghazni and visited some of, these, uh, some of the schools with which we were working back about uh, 16 months ago. But she said she went into the school, there were girls outside playing volleyball and so forth, and then she went in into the, and when I had visited the schools, the girls had come forward and said, you know, it's wonderful that CARE is supporting our education up to the sixth grade, but can't you do something to intervene beyond the sixth grade? Because the Taliban were absolutely, they would look the other way for the, for the basic education, but after the sixth grade, they were absolutely adamant that the girls could not continue. But there they were. Uh, the, uh, Sally walked into this uh, assembly, and there were hundreds of uh, girls in the first year of the secondary school. And uh, she asked, uh, how many of you uh, went to a care school? And more than half of them had raised their hand and said they'd gone to a care school. And it seems to me this is the role that NGOs play, to keep working on these issues through thick and thin, building the capacity, and laying the groundwork uh, for hope and, and a better day, including better governance. Please uh, join me in thanking Andrew Natsis and our panelists for a fascinating discussion on this evening.